Good afternoon. I'm Patrick Mann, Director of the School for Advanced Studies in the Arts and Humanities here at Western. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to this, our first presentation in the 2020-21 SASA Speaker Series. Now, in more usual times, I would be looking out at an audience of our students, my colleagues, and the friends and allies of SASA. And I won't belabor the fact that we do miss you. That said, we acknowledge that your joining us today is a vote of confidence in the work of SASA and in the importance of the work of the arts and humanities in change and transformation. Now, a lot of you will recall that our SASA speaker series has been thematized for a number of years. Several years ago, the theme was Humanize the Future. And we were thrilled to welcome our visiting professor that year, the important Indigenous artist Shelley Nero, to join us for a talk related to the theme. Last year, our theme was Evidence for the Future, and it was related to the work of Naomi Oreskes, the very important philosopher of science. We also welcomed our visiting professor from last year, Jamili Hassan to address us on her work as an artist and activist in relation to that theme. This year, we're thrilled to welcome the remarkable David Simmons as the visiting professor for our fourth year students. And effectively, our speaker series theme is derived and dedicated to the work and influence of David. The theme is Creativity, Innovation, Justice. Those of us who work in the humanities and work creatively know that oftentimes the languages that we speak and the languages spoken in seeking social justice can be synonymous. The course that David is teaching our first year students this year is entitled Power, Privilege and Public Persuasion, Storytelling as a Tool for Change. And those of us who have joined the course have certainly seen the alliances between creativity, innovation, and social justice. Now the talk that David will be giving you today is entitled Building Brand, Exercising Purpose, The Role of Communication in Driving Change. And I'm sure that we will all enjoy it. Our fourth year students will be joining David following the talk for a discussion. And we also welcome you to use the Q&A function if you want to send in some questions to add to our discussion. But before I turn it over, I want to recognize the very exciting news that the founding director of SASA, Dr. Joel Fafleck, has just been awarded the Okufa Teaching Award, which is a prestigious honor in the province of Ontario. Congratulations, Joel. Now, I'm going to turn the screen over to our SASA fourth year student, Sierra Joseph, who has written a wonderful land acknowledgement. And then we will hear from SASA's greatest champion, Dean Michael Mildy, who will introduce David Simmons. We hope you enjoy this afternoon's program. We acknowledge that Western University is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Lenape Wak, and Attawandaran peoples on lands connected with the London Township and Somber Treaties of 1796 and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wampum. With this, we respect the long-standing relationship that Indigenous nations have to this land as they are the original caretakers. We acknowledge historical and ongoing injustices that Indigenous peoples, including First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples, endure in Canada. We accept responsibility as a public institution to contribute towards revealing and correcting miseducation, as well as renewing respectful relationships with Indigenous communities through our teachings, research, and community service. I am a settler on this land, and therefore it is my responsibility to acknowledge the first cares of this land as Indigenous peoples. I know not everyone who attends this talk virtually is currently situated on the lands we have acknowledged, and therefore I urge everyone to reflect for a moment on the land you are on. Personally, I am originally from Barrie, Ontario, which is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek peoples. Here in university, I have learned more about Indigenous histories, ways of knowings, and perspectives than ever before. I know I must actively work against perpetrating colonialism in my education and in my actions. Reconciliation and decolonization does not begin with simply reading an acknowledgement. We must take it a step further. 
We must acknowledge Indigenous ways of knowing in the university as valuable information and stay informed on Indigenous initiatives to work as allies. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. And uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome David Simmons to this speaking engagement. Uh, I've known David for about 15 years, ever since he was involved in student politics here at Western. And uh, he and I used to uh, battle a little bit at the Senate, arguing about uh, various and sundry political things. Even then you could tell he was going to go on to do great things. Since graduating in 2007, David has indeed gone on to do fantastic things uh, in his professional life. He was most recently Senior Vice President for Communication for McKesson Canada. He was a communications and strategy firm uh, navigator before that. And he also did things like uh, working for the CBC as a commentator. While he was doing those things, he wasn't busy enough, so he found time to do lots of uh, volunteer work. Currently, he's working with Catalyst, a nonprofit that works supporting women in the workforce. And he's also the president, uh, incoming president for the Canadian Club of Toronto. He works with Casey House, EGAL, the Metro Convention Center uh, Board, the Mowat Center, and the Monk School of Global Affairs. He's done a lot of volunteer work there. And he's also uh, been very kind to his alma mater. He's served as the president of the uh, Western uh, Alumni Association, and he served for some years uh, on the Board of Governors. In all of these roles, he's been tremendously effective. And really, what ties all those elements together, as you will soon see, is his capacity for storytelling, for understanding what it is that makes narrative work, what makes it effective, what makes it an instrument of social change. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome David Simmons to present his talk tonight. David. Thank you, Dean Milday. It's a real pleasure to, uh, to be here with, uh, with, the, with SASA, with the Faculty of Arts and Humanities, and, and to be at Western. Uh, I'd be remiss not to uh, express my, um, the, the emotion of, I, I feel really uh, humbled uh, to be a visiting professor at SASA. I feel that way every Friday when I, I join my class uh, the, who are with us today. Um, I think you got a snippet of the uh, intellect uh, and the curiosity uh, through Sierra's land acknowledgement. She's one of uh, many students uh, in, in the program and in the class that I am impressed by and moved by every week. And uh, I'm just so thrilled to be learning uh, on this journey with, with the students. Um, as I prepared for today, uh, I really wanted to be at home. Uh, I think to, to Patrick's point, um, normally we'd be at Western together. Uh, tomorrow starts Western's homecoming celebration. So we're gonna be doing that virtually. So it's kind of fitting that we're doing this talk virtually. Um, as I prepared uh, notes for today, I wanted to acknowledge that um, my thoughts are going to be informed by my practice. And so Michael's mentioned that, uh, you know, I communicate and storytell for a living. And so what I've tried to do is marry lessons and insights that I've gathered from the work that I've done professionally over the last 15 or so years. And then um, the uh, lessons and insights that I gathered from my academic journey, um, which started at Western to Michael's point in political science, uh, media theory and films and philosophy uh, in the arts and humanities, and went on to cultural studies uh, and, uh, and, and some business and some business courses in graduate school. Uh, so there's a blend of that. I will also acknowledge that much of what you'll see is not my own thinking. There's reflections there, but this work is reflective of scholars uh, that are referenced in the course and, and, and you can access that information uh, through our syllabus. Um, so without further ado, I think we, we wanna uh, pull up some slides and, and have a conversation. And I think there's time for questions at the end as well. I wanted to start by saying um, that purpose matters. Um, uh, I wanna start by saying purpose matters in uh, the pursuit of fairness and in the pursuit of progress. Um, and that when we discuss purpose, there are matters of purpose that we have to wrestle with. Uh, and in my upbringing and my lived experience, I think I've come to know and celebrate that stories and communications are a key tool in creating a shared understanding of purpose and driving that shared understanding in order to drive change. Uh, 
Uh, and so I wanna share a journey uh, with you uh, and some reflections of that. If we go to the next slide, um, many of you may know the name David Estock, and I wanna acknowledge him as a Western grad and former staff member at Western, who's now a leader at the University of Toronto. Uh, he's been a mentor of mine in communication since I met him uh, 15 or 16 years ago. And one of the things he used to tell me is never start a presentation with someone else's words. Uh, never start a presentation with someone else's quote. Uh, and so, sorry, David, I'm starting this one with someone else's words. Uh, as I was thinking about purpose and I was thinking about story and I was thinking about narrative um, for a whole series of reasons that was brought to Dr. King's words. Uh, and something that he said that is often not uh, wrestled with or, or, or shared, because I think so much of his, his words have, have become history. Uh, Dr. King tells us that power is the ability to achieve a purpose. Uh, whether or not it's good or bad depends upon the purpose. And, you know, the, if the students in, in the course with me this year spent a lot of time deconstructing this concept of power and deconstructing this concept of who has it and who doesn't, whose voices are heard and whose voices are often muted. And I think in, in, our, in our time, in our space right now, where we're having this sort of inflection point or collision of, of justice, racial justice, social justice, uh, gender issues, uh, this, this came to me uh, and I wanted to put it up here as a starting point or a leveling point for us that I think there is an appetite amongst, I would argue the majority, uh, that we ought to do better, that as a society we need to do better and that our story needs editing. Uh, that our voices need to be amplified uh, in a way that acknowledges the margin. Uh, and so I wanted to ground us in this understanding that if power exists, uh, that we uh, as actors and agitators have a responsibility to try to define that purpose and level power in order to drive a better purpose. And I think Dr. King's words are quite fitting in that. Power with purpose, you know, power as a concept in, uh, in the early parts of the course, uh, our students have done a tremendous job wrestling with Bell Hooks's writing, and I'm so impressed by uh, by their reflections and uh, some work that they've done over the past few weeks with with Hooks and Foucault, for that matter. And we talked a lot about power and 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 some of the limitations, some of the colonial nature of power. Um, and in that reflection, one of the things I want to offer is that if you collide uh, purpose with power, there is somewhat of an anti-colonial opportunity there. And I say anti-colonial versus post because I think you know, we've had discussions around the need for us to actively deconstruct power and its traditional understanding. So in this concept of power with purpose, I would suggest to you that purpose can emphasize an interdependence and collective action. So I think those, you know, those of us who may identify as progressives or have done work, you know, in what would be called, you know, left of center issues would, would you know, work with this understanding that if you can bring people together, that if you can, if you can create a common, common uh, purpose and common values, then you can leverage power for the better, that you can shift and expand power for the whole or for the, for the good of the whole. And, and again, I wanna suggest that what I'm gonna talk to you about is some examples and some, some expectation, I think, social expectation, that those with power ought to be acting um, for the good of the whole, and that those of us who may not be in power ought to be agitating for um, those with power to act uh, in the greater good. Stories in their essence have power. Uh, and I wanna suggest that great stories move readers to action that if you tell a story and no one feels anything at the end, you've wasted your time, right? Um, my life tells me, and, and some of you know this, I was raised in, in a very uh, Judeo-Christian tradition. My grandparents were in the ministry. And so from a very young age, I was exposed to this act of engaging others through narrative and this act of engaging others through a call to leadership or a call to purpose. And I think what I learned from my childhood through to higher education and then in my professional vocation is that what good stories, really well-crafted stories help break inertia, that they enable us to communicate values to one another in a way that, that brings people together and can often pull down walls. So if that's true and we can accept that power exists for good or for bad and that there is some system uh, that, that we are ingrained in by choice or not, then I would say that there's this new, um, this new actor uh, in, in capitalist societies, particularly called brands. Uh, 
and that brands and their stories drive us to think things, they drive us to say things, and they drive us to do things. Uh, and so as a corporate actor in my professional life, and as a volunteer on issues that are close to my identity and heart, I've learned an exercise that we ought to craft stories that leverage power, leverage common values, and get the audience to think, say, or do what we are, what we desire. So there's some element of force there, and there's a lot of element of influence there. And so I want to take you through a couple of uh, ways that, that that happens. There's this concept of leadership storytelling that um, I was introduced to uh, in business school. And this concept is that um, in the most traditional sense of politics or the most traditional sense of community organizing, they're, they're, that leaders would call people to purpose. And again, I shared my Judeo-Christian upbringing. You know, I think the texts that we would reflect on, there are leaders and pillars in those stories that call us to, to, to greater goods or call us to values and morality. I think that that's then exercised itself through capitalist society in the way that brands, corporations, organizations, unions um, would, would act. And there's, there's, there's some work that suggests that great leadership stories have three components to them. That great leadership stories first offer a story of self. And there's, this is this concept of defining or being defined. So in a pursuit of power and a wrestling of power, if you don't define yourself, but you're making an effort to move, your opponent will define you. Um, you know, the, 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 the course this year uh, engaged with the prince as a text, and, and there were some very helpful reflections around the advice uh, that Machiavelli gives the prince uh, around the ability to exercise that power in order to preserve self. And so, you know, one of the key pillars of a great leadership story is how do you define yourself in order to offer values um, to the reader that they may identify with. The second pillar of great leadership storytelling is a story of us. So what experiences and values do we share as a community and that bring us together? You know, the key to getting someone to think, say, or do something is to create some level of commonality, some level of understanding between what you'd like them to do and where they currently stand on the issue. And then the third element of great leadership storytelling is this, this concept of the story of now. This concept that you could introduce a fierce sense of urgency that, that calls people to action or introduce them to something that's stubbornly persistent, something that's so difficult that it demands their attention, right? So great stories don't leave us without a call to leadership or a call to action. And, and what I would suggest is that the, the old days of corporate storytelling uh, rested on this idea of advertising, right? Rested on this idea of consumption that they would give you a choice of this or that. You know, you watch Mad Men or you think about the Madison Avenue days, it was really about influencing just your consumption choice. There's been a shift in the way that corporations exercise their power and the way that brands exercise their power, where they're either deliberately or by sense uh, a competition exercising leadership stories. And so this practice of politics, you know, when I started in politics when I left higher education, in politics, you try to enlist the voter to your position through the introduction of value, through the introduction of a threat to that value, and then a need to protect that value. So despite your political persuasion, there's a bit of a formula in the way that politics and political communications works. I would suggest that in, in the last 30 years, 40 years, political communicators have infiltrated Madison Avenue or advertising. So we've gone from K Street to, to Bay Street, and we've changed the way that corporations act. So rather than act offering you a choice between brand A and brand B, we're offering you to enlist into our value set, to enlist into our habits in order to consume our product. So if you think about great brands in, in sort of modern day, you think about an Apple, for example. If you were to walk around my house, there'd be so many Apple products, it's an embarrassment, right? So Apple has effectively enlisted me into their value system. And in doing so, they open themselves up to criticism or to investigation by me as a consumer, right? So the story of us invites me to question their values. And there's some risk to that. There's some opportunity to that. I was thinking to myself, well, is that believable? Is that true? If you think about US politics, for example, most of the last, I think, 10 White House press secretaries have all gone on to have the role of chief communications officer for a major brand. 
those roles would have normally been occupied by a true marketer, someone who sells the product, right? So Robert Gibbs, the Obama uh, press secretary, went on to McDonald's and served for seven years as their chief communications officer. Robert Gibbs never sold a hamburger before his time at McDonald's, but he was entrusted with building, communicating, and enlisting followers to that brand. Jay Carney, who was the last Obama press secretary, went on to Amazon. And Amazon, again, Jay didn't run an e-commerce business before going into to, to Amazon, but his job is to protect and to build that brand. Sarah Willis, who was a Republican communicator, build and protects the Cardinal Health brand, who's a major competitor to my most recent employer, McKesson. And the person in the chief communications officer job at McKesson is a former uh, uh, Washington operative as well. So if you think about just the facts, the facts suggest that brands are no longer just advertising, they're enlisting us with values in order to drive action. So how do they do that? So as you think about the way that you've consumed with brands in the marketplace, I'm going to suggest to you that when I counsel chief executives, whether as a consultant or as a senior communications officer, there's three things that I would often build the story around. The first is relationship building. So as we craft the story of self or the story of the leader, the whole objective of that story is to create relationship between the leader and the audience. I think that's true. Again, we learn that in politics. We see exercise in business. I could make the case it happens in higher education, right? Patrick and Michael offer reflections to you as leaders of a program and a faculty that create commonality between you as a member of the faculty, a student or a staff member, and them as administrators or leaders in their roles. The second piece of that is to give you motivation. If you can create connection and commonality between you and the audience, then there ought to be a motivation to come together, right? To create something that is common. You move from that to then choice. If you have a relationship, if you have a shared motivation and understanding, then you make the choice to think, say, or do uh, an action to preserve or protect this thing that you've created, this brand that you need to protect, this, this, this voice that you want to amplify. So again, we're taking, we're walking on this journey of power exists, it's in a system, and then we ought to think about how we exercise or amplify it. In the reflection uh, in the course that we are, we're, the journey that we're on as learners, and I think in my own journey in politics and in, in business, you know, I've come to realize or I've come to see Amplified because I was introduced to Hooks in undergrad and she's become sort of a, 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 a hobby read of me and mine. I, I go back and visit her work on a regular basis, their work on a regular basis. One of the things that's really important from an academic reflection and then a practice in business is, is we know it to be true that positional power amplifies a storyteller, right? It's this concept of, you know, where you sit gives you privilege and you need to either exercise that privilege or acknowledge it. My suggestion when I think about brands and with the preamble I've just given you is that corporations and organizations, institutions have a level of power that is arguably unmatched, right? They give meaning and they help shape perception. Right. So we see that in politics on a regular basis as a racial minority, as a sexual minority. I live in a world where originalist founders wouldn't have imagined my existence to be equal to theirs. And so I have made a decision to agitate, to enter into these institutions and organizations and help redefine those brands, help redefine those organizations, institutions to give meaning and shape perception that would then result in a more inclusive world for me. This is, this, is, this is happening all around us. It's happening in higher education. It's happening uh, in retail. It's happening in politics. Um, and as it happens, the suggestion that I make in our course and the suggestion that I want to make today is that as citizens, we have to hold organizations and institutions to a higher standard, one that reflects how we want the world to be and one that ensures that these brands move us to a better place than where we started. I'm part of uh, a group called the Canadian Centre for the Purpose of the Corporation. Uh, this group is a group of 12 Canadians that have come together uh, from various aspects of life, from business, from politics, and from civil society, and issued a call to leadership to corporate Canada to say, you ought to do better. 
that Canadians expect you to do better. And as you build your brand and exercise your brand using the practice that we I just talked about today and that the 12 of us have all worked in, yeah, it's time for you to, to deliver the goods, right? So to sort of, to move the dial forward. So something that we did this summer that I wanted to share with you that's, that's new and that, that hasn't been disseminated very, very broadly is a survey. We did a survey of Canadians in July and we asked them, uh, if you just go back one slide, we asked them to talk to us about what they thought needed to change in Canada. Uh, from a corporate perspective, what where they thought corporations needed to move. And so, you know, many of these Canadians will see their former journalists, their former premiers, their university presidents, uh, their editors of newspapers, um, and administrators in business and energy, healthcare, uh, and forestry, you'll see there. So I encourage you to visit that if, if you can. But we did this survey, and I'll just talk to you quickly about the research there on the next slide. We did a, a sample of 3,000 Canadians who are 16 years of age or older. And this is a this is a, a robust uh, sample of Canadians, and uh, and we decided to do 16 versus 18, where we normally would do 18, because we wanted to get a sense of what the next generation of voter would want to see happen from a corporate perspective as they start thinking about. Um, social justice issues in society. We did the survey in both English and French, and there's a statistical margin of error that we think is representative of the sample, 19 times out of 20. To go to the next slide, a couple of observations that came out of this work. We asked the 3,000 participants to tell us unprompted what were the number one concerns, uh, social concerns facing the world. And this was quite telling because, you you know, Brian Gallant is, is leading this work with us, former premier of New Brunswick, former student leader, um, which is how we know each other. Um, in politics, the, the issues are usually the economy, healthcare, and something else. At province, provincially, you know, if you're in Quebec, it might be language. If you're in Ontario, it might be education. Unprompted, Canadians told us their number one concern was income inequality. That is remarkable. I think that's the first time in the 15 or so years that I've been working on campaigns, income inequality was the number one issue without prompt. The second was climate change. Again, environment comes up in these surveys when you start looking at political campaigns and issues, but it's very rarely often the second most important issue unprompted by the respondent. And the third, and again, we did this survey in July in the height of our Black Lives Matter movement in North America and Europe, particularly was inequities in treatment and discrimination. So we came up with that text, but the responses were around racial justice. They were around Black Lives Matter. You often heard the names George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. And then you saw what followed there world economy, the economic recovery, and overall social issues. So to see the economy, which is often always the number one response, fall to the fourth behind wealth, climate, and race tells us that there's a greater appetite in society to see change and to particularly ask corporations to help lead that change. Go to the next slide. We asked uh, Canadians if they believed that uh, the world is headed in the right direction, that putting COVID aside, you know, did we live in a fair society? And nationally, half of the respondents said no, which again, is quite shocking. If you think about Canada's consensus or the way that our country was founded, uh, you know, different from a sort of flags and fear patriotism in the US, we don't often see this concept that Canada is an unfair society. And we saw it come out loud and clear that Canadians on average, one and two said, something's not right in Canada. That, that social justice isn't really manifesting in the way that we want it to. What was most shocking for me, having lived and worked in Quebec for some time, was Quebec scored the lowest. And again, if you, if you follow Quebec politics and the history of that province, there is a pretty high standard of fairness and a pretty high standard of social investment to ensure that there's a level of justice, particularly in the way that services are offered in that province. Right. There's a there's a contract or agreement that citizens enter into in Quebec to say, I'll offer this for that. So to see it come out that low was particularly uh, telling. I think two things happened this year in Quebec or the last two or three years in Quebec that drove that. One, I think there is a, a, a higher sensitivity to the environment in that province from a political perspective. And two, there's been quite the reckoning around 
immigration in that province and the representation of people in politics and business in that province. So we know the history of Quebec from a language rights perspective. Um, I think many of us will remember the religious symbols discussion and debate in that province and the way that it boiled over into a debate on race and the immigration of predominantly black identified francophones uh, from Northern Africa and the Caribbean. We asked Canadians whether they thought business leaders ought to be doing more, and they overwhelmingly said yes, that if business leaders were delivering on their promise, they would be doing more. 81% of respondents said that corporations play a vital role in the economy, not only creating jobs, but fostering innovation and providing goods and services. And 48% of respondents told us that Canadian corporations are a force for good within society. That's pretty telling, right? That half of our respondents said, not only is it a company's job, to contribute to the economic growth of, of the nation, it's their job to be a force for justice in society, which again is a little bit different than a traditional understanding of a capitalist model. Sixty-two percent of Canadians said that in corporations in Canada do better, that Canadians do better. So there's this interesting juxtaposition of, you know, corporations need to do more, and if they do more and they do well, then Canadians will do well. You know, so it's an interesting sort of response. 78% of Canadians agreed that corporations should contribute more to the betterment of society. That is a shockingly large number. So I was a chief executive in Canada. I'd be pretty sensitive to the fact that potentially, you know, two thirds, if, if, you, if you wanted to take some air out of the number of my uh, potential customer base thinks that I need to be driving uh, progress in society. Go to the next one for me. What was really, really telling for me, having worked uh, for the fifth largest company in America for the last seven years, is that overwhelmingly more than half of the respondents said that capitalism is broken in some way. That that our model, whether you know we agreed to enter into it or not, is nearing an inflection point where it's not going well. Um, a strong majority said that capitalism has to be reformed to be more inclusive, or it should be completely replaced. So the completely replaced piece is, is I think, a bit more on the margin. But to see the number that here, that large, that 55% of people who responded to our survey said, hey, something's not right here, tells us that they're starting to question these brands. So again, my observation or my, my analysis here is that as communicators, as storytellers, we introduce this concept of values and connectivity between our brand and the consumer, not just the product. When we do that, we invite the consumer in to question what our values are and to question how much we're adhering to them, right? So oftentimes when we go through hiring, for example, the fourth year students in our class are thinking about what they might do next. In interviews, you're often asked, how do you think about corporate values? How do those manifest in the workplace? You know, what does it feel like to be a minority in the workplace? Do you have gender equity on your leadership team? As we invite consumers into our brands, we invite um, prosecution of whether or not we're living those values. We go to the next one. This was a really interesting question too, that corporate purpose ought to be broader than, than shareholder values. So, you know, a traditional economist would tell you that the number one obligation of a corporation is to return value to its shareholder, right? So what's the ROI being produced by the company? Now, there's this movement uh, that's really taken traction in Europe and the United States, particularly, that the shareholder is not the only st stakeholder in a uh, corporate, uh, corporate world, that we ought to be thinking about employees, we ought to be thinking about indigenous peoples, for example, in the energy sector, the forestry sector, and even in financial services, we ought to be thinking about uh, how the corporation impacts the success or limitation of the people and the environment in which it exists. What was really interesting is that we saw not an equal, but an interesting split between seniors and Gen Z's millennials, for example, um, and con provinces that would traditionally be more conservative versus more progressive. So irregardless of where you sat, the majority of Canadians said, we don't necessarily think that it's enough for a corporation to just create a, a, a financial return. They ought to be creating a social return. Again, when I layer over the importance of storytelling and the way that we've activated brands in the recent uh, 
uh, time, it tells me that we may have created this issue or this investigation around connectivity and progress. Go to the next one. On top of that, what we heard as a, as a closing or parting comment was that 65% of Canadians think that corporations are not living up to their promise. And so when you hear the word corporation, I would suggest you could replace that with brands. That brands in our stories, in the way that we're manifesting our purpose, we're not actually delivering on the well-being of our stakeholders, that we're still only looking at profits as a priority. And that's alarming for an operator. It's also interesting for a storyteller, because if we know that people are going to choose where they, they park their money or their confidence based on the values being lived, there's an opportunity there. Go to the next one. And respondents told us that they would choose to work in places that were more aligned with the manifestation of values than not. Particularly high was Gen Zs. And again, Gen Zs, you know, are, are individuals who may not have been in the workforce for a long time, may not have the same financial responsibilities or obligations as a boomer or, you know, a Gen Xer, but uh but nonetheless, as they look to enter the labor market, they're saying, I take a lower salary to work for a company that reflects my values. If you think about the tech boom that's happening or the tech boom that happened in Silicon Valley, there are a number of those organizations that have created brands that were absent of purpose and are now having huge talent issues because their talent is saying, this doesn't feel right. This doesn't this doesn't sound right, right? So we're seeing that at Facebook. Talent is leaving Facebook because they think you have an obligation to engage in democracy more responsibly here. We saw that in Twitter. Um, we're seeing that uh, come to life with Amazon and Google. Critics saying, wait a second, are our values being reflected and how does this story impact the way that we live our lives and exercise our power? It's gone so far that some Canadians are demanding regulators take action to uh, limit or to force uh, those with positional power to do better at exercising their brand or their promise and their purpose. Some of you may have seen that the Ministry of Heritage has been wrestling over the last seven years or so with regulation on e-commerce companies, regulation on tech companies, on ju not just information, but how they're trading, what they're selling, how they keep information, what our privacy rights look like. So it's not just financials. So we saw earlier that people are gonna choose brands that are more reflective of their values. It's not just talent. People are gonna work in places that are reflective of their values. We're now seeing that people are gonna vote for governments that are gonna ensure their values are, are manifested in the way that reflects where they want to be. When I think about this and I reflect on the summer that was in 2020 in our current coronavirus environment, I would suggest that monumental moments are driven by stories that stir values. So that big change, and we think about the power of change and the positional power of organizations, they are driven not by business cases, but by moral cases. And so, you know, in our course, we do a lot of thinking around how we're going to move an audience to a position that reflects our values. Sierra did a tremendously uh, a powerful job today in her land acknowledgement, and she followed the structural narrative of my story, our story, and a call to leadership on Indigenous reconciliation and our obligation as settlers on this land. And, and I think, you know, that when I listened to Sierra, that was a moral case that it is the right thing for us. It is our obligation and our duty to investigate and to prosecute our own existence in this country and what that looks like. That's very different than traditional sort of advocacy and storytelling that if you could get PwC or BCG or McKinsey to say it was a good idea, it'd be the right idea. And I'd say to you that that's been the case for quite some time. That if we think about things like voting rights, like pay equity, like Medicare, like equal marriage for LGBT uh, com the community, our telecommunications infrastructure in Canada was not a business case. It was a case of connecting the country. Our railway was not a business case. It was a case of connecting the country. So as we think about brands and stories and power, I would say that there's an opportunity based on the data we just saw and based on the art of storytelling to start invest, investing in moral cases for change rather than just the business case for change. And if you don't believe me, I want to give you a couple of examples of brands that have done this tremendously well. 
Nike is probably the most popular brand that has adopted this position as agitator or, or, or brand on the edge. One of the largest consumer goods companies in the world, the largest athletic company in the world, takes positions on issues that they know is going to sit well with their consumer. They've invited a consumer into their brand promise and as a result have to be ready, willing, and able to be prosecuted for not living that brand promise. This is an ad that features Colin Kaepernick. Many of you would have seen it. This was an ad that was taken out after Colin Kaepernick was unsuccessful in being re-signed to an NFL franchise after he protested police brutality of African Americans in America. Nonviolent protesting, a right guaranteed under the Constitution, but there's this split, and again, a political conversation we can have another day between ownership, labor, power, positional talent in the NFL, and to this day, he's not signed. So after he was unable to be signed, Nike launched this campaign, paid him a significant amount of money to then start the Kaepernick Foundation and push his narrative, his story, his values of racial justice um, in America. And you'll see the text, believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything. So again, Nike's whole philosophy was just do it, right? Their whole philosophy was you ought to push yourself past boundary, past limitation in order to achieve success. For Kaepernick, who was one of their star targets um, before he was cut from the 49ers, it was sort of a call to leadership of their own. They created a me story, an us story, and a call to leadership that wasn't necessarily tied to race, but as one of their athletes was colliding with this question of race, they stood in support of Kaepernick. When this ad was introduced, they were criticized immensely. Their stock dropped, I think, uh, 12 or 13 percent the day that the ad came out. You had pundits on conservative news stations saying that Nike should uh, avoid commenting on this. Um, and this was uh, one of the incidences that pushed LeBron James and the current president of the United States to have a uh, exchange on social media about whether athletes should have a voice. We were actually joined by a global director from Nike last week in our class, and she talked a little bit about when the Black Lives Matter protest happened, the fact that this ad had been in the market, the fact that Nike had taken a position on this story meant that they had to do something. And, and I'll just ask Blizzard to play what they decided to do. Thank you, Bozra. So I wanted to play the Nike example, one, because we had the benefit of having Nike with us last week in class, two, because uh, Amy, who joined us, is a Western alum uh, who works at Nike, which is just a great connection to our campus, and three, because I think it's a pretty powerful example of, an, of, of a company's brand promise going from just do it to don't do it, uh, being in the market on a controversial issue. Uh, after they launched that ad, they actually recovered um, a significant amount of market capitalization and drove sales uh, across the brand. You saw individuals buying Nike. So I should have said when they did the Kaepernick ad, there was also a number of people in the United States that went out and burnt their product. They went out and literally light their Nikes on fire and said, Nike should not be taking a position on this issue because it's political. Um, and when they decided to weigh in on the BLM movement, one of the first Fortune 500 companies to make a public statement, they recovered a significant amount of market capitalization and drove sales, um, a record number of sales. So again, not the reason, but a, a, a variable effect of taking a position. So one of uh, Nike's statements now that they're putting all across the market uh, as they cancel their Tokyo campaign and move to this new campaign that um, it can't stop us is that while sport may not be able to change everything, it can always be the platform for athletes to start, create, 
and catapult us all forward. And so they're leaning into this promise with Kaepernick, with LeBron James and his dispute with the president. And you saw uh, with the recent um, uh, tennis tournament with the, the masks that were worn with the lives of African-Americans that were murdered at the hands of police. If we go to the next slide. This uh, is a Canadian example of a brand. I think everyone should know Sean Mendez. If you don't know Sean Mendez, he's a Canadian artist from Pickering. And I hope everybody knows Sidney Crosby, uh, one of the greatest hockey players of his generation, who's also a Canadian. Tim Hortons has become synonymous with Canada, right? I was in the, it was in the UK uh, earlier this year and Canadians went to, I hate Tim Hortons, I'll be very candid, I can't drink their coffee. Uh, my family uh, farms coffee in Jamaica, so I, I really can't drink their coffee. But I go to Tim Hortons and I just feel like I'm at home, right? It's, it's tremendously Canadian. One of the challenges that Tim Hortons as a brand had since it was purchased by Restaurant Brands International was its franchise relationship. So the consumer promise at Tim Hortons was that it is unabashedly Canadian, right? So much so that it's in foreign markets, in small places, close to Canadian um, uh, centers of, of, of culture. In Ontario, under the Wynn government, the government introduced a new minimum wage proposal that would have increased the minimum wage to $14, $14.25, I think, as on the route to 15. And Tim Hortons franchisees launched an aggressive campaign against the premier and the government, saying that uh, they couldn't afford that and that if the government forced it through legislation, they would pass that cost on to consumers. And so they put up signs in uh, their stores. They launched radio ads that said, Kathleen Wynne is going to introduce the price of your double-double. Now, as a political strategist at the time, working with this party in particular, it was a very interesting discussion on what was going to happen with this, with this issue. There was a lot of fear and trepidation in the Liberal Party of Ontario that uh, actors would not be able to take on a brand as powerful and strong as Tim Hortons. But the research told us that Tim Hortons franchisees in taking on this idea of fairness, right? The minimum wage was, increasing the minimum wage was an issue of fairness around poverty reduction in society and giving people a living wage, which arguably is not $15 an hour, that the government would win. That the government would win on fair and reasonable because Tim Hortons was violating its own brand promise of what it meant to be Canadian. That Canadians identified with fairness and that they would lose. And it turned out that they did that it got so bad for the Tim Hortons franchise organizations and all the premier had to do was repeat that this was a question of fairness and a question of justice and she wanted to see a minimum wage of $15. And so much so that the parent company for Tim Hortons just like said to that, that franchisee group, you're on your own. If you're gonna do this, you're, you're lighting, you know, creating a huge problem for yourself and we're encouraging you to stop. Uh, and they had to pull out. They canceled their protest, they pulled down their signs and then the parent company came on side with the government to increase the minimum wage. So you see an example of a company running into its brand in the face of public criticism and one running away from it and then resulting in public criticism. I'm gonna give you a couple more examples. This is a Tim Hortons competitor in Starbucks. Um, many of you will know Starbucks built its brand on this, this concept or this promise called the third space. Uh, Howard Schultz, their CEO, had this idea that he would create a space that wasn't home and that wasn't work, but that gave you a bit of both, a place where you could go and reflect and work and connect and be comfortable. And in doing so, they entered into this, this dynamic, particularly in urban centers and then in small cities and communities uh, in rural areas, college campuses, particularly in the United States, arguably in Canada in some respects, where there were progressive conversations and people gathering in this third space for hours. And, and for whatever reason, LGBT rights or the, 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 the lived experiences of, of LGBT people became a topic of power and a topic of brand promise at Starbucks. They were very early into entering pride parades. They were very early into putting up rainbow flags in their stores. They were very early into investing in LGBT organizations in the communities that they were in. Then something happened in the United States where uh, individuals individual state governments were presenting legislation to change the law around gender identification in restrooms, which would require business owners to have to police, for lack of a better word, and I don't mean that in, in any way to slight the police officer on the, the slide, police who was using their bathrooms in what store. At the time, the CEO of Starbucks said, this doesn't sit well with our values and we're not going to do it. We're not going to engage in that conversation. We're going to support our LGBT employees, our community, because that's part of our promise in creating the third space. Well, Howard shareholders were furious and they said, 
you should not get into a discussion with, with state legislators about uh, what they want to do. This is a political issue and you ought to sell coffee. And there's a very famous exchange that I won't play for you, but you can look up where Howard tells these very large shareholders they can sell their shares that violating the values of the company was not something that he was willing to do and that he would rather not have their money than be told what to do in that space. There was a big, big news coverage that afternoon after the shareholder meeting and Starbucks shares spiked because again, the promise that they put in the market to consumers was being reflected by their CEO in a way that was telling. He was willing to lose capitalization in order to live his values. And again, my, my suggestion is that the way we tell stories and the way that brands are showing up are moving us into this space of expectation on our chief executives. Next example. This one was very, very interesting. So I mentioned that I most recently worked for McKesson Corporation. McKesson is the fifth largest company in America, uh, 15 largest in the world. We distribute one in three medications uh, that are used uh, in, in Europe, uh, North America, uh, and, and some parts of, of Asia. Uh, our biggest competitor is Cardinal Health. These are two companies you probably never heard of because we're, we're distribution companies behind the pharmacy, behind the hospital. When George Floyd was murdered, I remember getting a call from our CEO saying, we want to put out a statement. We need to do, we need to do something for our employees. We need to do something for our community. And me and the lawyers, the general counsel, my counterpart in the US, the head of public policy in the US, spent hours on the phone trying to figure out what we could legitimately say in order to give credence and amplify the pain that our US employee population in particular was feeling and our black identified employee population was feeling. I can say I'm very proud of Brian and the statement that McKesson made the day after George Floyd was murdered, um, but I was extremely impressed with our competitor's statement. We, like many other US-based companies, made a statement that acknowledged the murder of George Floyd as unacceptable and a part of our um, very, very unfortunate history on racial justice in America. Cardinal, whose head office was in the state that George was murdered in, decided to be even more bold. They decided to use George's words to amplify his story. And their press release and their statement was very, very brief. And to my, the, my, the learners in my class, remember, we're going to talk about press release next week. It doesn't have to be long. They decided to put it a one paragraph statement with the headline, I can't breathe. And they chose those three words as enough to amplify their values of inclusion, of racial justice and diversity at Cardinal, that it was, enough was enough and the inhumanity had to stop. Our statement at McKesson was a full page. So it, it reminds us the power of language. It reminds us the power of narrative. They put their me story, their us story, and their call to action in one paragraph by using three words. So as I close today, I want to say that stories are going to lead the way forward. Stories are powerful. They drive change. The research that we were able to uh, see today um, through my other day job is telling us that I think Canadians are demanding more from brands because brands have asked uh, consumers to come in to their world. So three things I, I'd like to say as we close. Stories matter and that good stories told with passion are going to be critical to change. Let them illuminate experience and create a connection for us. Remember to leverage narrative as you share meaning and understanding. I think place matters. And I do think it's really important that we did our acknowledgement of our place uh, in Canada and in this nation. Cultures create meaning and bring people together. And cultures are not exclusive to just social settings. Corporate cultures and brand cultures create this. And now more than ever, particularly as we're virtual living through this pandemic, we are seeking community. And so I think we ought to think about place-based narratives that incorporate partnerships and cement commitment. There needs to be some permanency to the way that we bring people together in our us story. And I think that now more than ever, purpose matters. So to think about Dr. King, power with purpose can drive change. We ought to be thinking about the story of me, the story of us, and the story of now. Thanks very much for your time. And we'll invite your questions. If you want to use your blue hand, that would be the, uh, the most efficient. I don't think I have a blue. Oh, there's one blue hand. 
so I'm not seeing the blue. Oh, Sophia, do you want to go ahead? Um, sure. So uh, I know you, you spoke a lot in this talk and you've talked a lot about it in our class as well, about how storytelling is really important and it, it drives change and it's kind of in some ways the foundation for change. Um, but I guess sometimes people probably feel like they have an issue that's close to them and that they really care about, but they don't know how to start telling this story. So I guess this is maybe a two-pronged question. Um, first, is storytelling um, something that anybody can learn to do very effectively, or do you think in some cases it's more of a gift that people just naturally have? And second, for people who may have something that's very close to them, um, do you have any advice on how they could start forming this, this story so that they can actually drive action and change? So I would say, and I'd invite other experts around the table to weigh in on this, I think that a great story is an argument and that if you can construct argument, you can write a story. Um, and I think, you know, the reason why I often use the example in our class of the story of me, us, and now is it gives you some sort of a structure to follow in creating the argument. Um, I think delivering the story, and we're going to do this together in our class projects, calls on a level of talent that's unique to the to the storyteller, right? So some of us, again, I was raised in a ministerial tradition, so I tend to disproportionately orally storytell because that's how I was raised. Patrick's a visual artist. So I would suggest that he uh, he probably has quite the skill at storytelling through 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 visual art in a way that I probably am terrible at. Michael's a political philosopher. If you read his work, which I would encourage you to do, you would see that the way he can craft argument with the written word is way better than I could ever imagine to do. So, and that's why when we would argue at Senate, I would always make sure it wasn't through written submission. It was uh, at some sort of a table with a microphone. So, so find your ability or your forum to story tell and marry that to a well-structured argument. And I think you, you'll be in a good position. I oft, I think that's another proof point for why political communicators like myself end up in large marketing roles, right? So if you think about a, a presidential press secretary going to lead marketing for a fast food chain, that's a result of him having to stand up every day and argue a, a position to a bunch of mediators, right? So then he ought to be able to get up and argue that McDonald's is the choice over Burger King or Wendy's or Taco Bell. I think when you think about your own story, this concept of reflection, and I think that's why, you know, Patrick Buzzer and I decided that reflections would be uh, a helpful tool for us in this course, and you'll, you're doing that and doing that quite well. And I had to do this for myself, being able to reflect on what part of my story I was willing to be honest about and tie into my own argument uh, helped me be a better storyteller. So at Western, I was an athlete. I was a student leader. Uh, and all those things were comfortable. What I was at, what I was very uncomfortable with, not even my race, I was very proudly Black and I was very proudly Afrocentric in the way that I showed up because I was raised in a family like that. What I was terrified of was my sexuality. And I ran from it in so many, so many directions. I didn't come out until the end of my time in undergrad. And I was in environments that were tremendously supportive. I worked in residence life. I was on the students council. I was in the ally network. But being honest about that part of my story was terrifying. And I needed a lot of support in order to be able to do that. Now, that is a huge part of my story. It's in my bio. I do LGBT advocacy. I do HIV AIDS advocacy. Like it's a huge part because I was able to get some level of construction on that. And I think that only happens through reflection and through support. I remember my graduate uh, thesis, I initially went in to think to, 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 to wrestle with this question of black identity and the way it shows up in education um, and whether Afrocentric education was an appropriate tool for persistence. That's a long way of, and I remember my, my supervisor challenging me and saying, you don't actually care about race and education. You care about sexuality and race and how that's limiting success. And she was absolutely right that my own story of marrying my racial identity with my sexual identity and my passion for access to education was what I was actually interested in investigating. And that's how I landed on Bell Hooks. So um, yeah, a lot of my story there for you in answering your question. Thanks, I think Julia next. Hi there. Um, thanks again for an amazing presentation. I've been enjoying this course so far and I'm looking forward to our class tomorrow. Um, it's just something came up again with that 
um, us and now, um, me or self, us and now call to action. I think especially about the call to action because when it comes to social activism, and specifically climate change, it's so often about awareness and not, and even though we want that call to action to also have an action part, not just an awareness, but we need like to see things happening. And I'm thinking about the climate clock that just went up in Times Square that says, we've got the seven year window to make the changes before climate change is irreversible. And I wonder like how we can tell a good story and have a good call to action, even if we don't necessarily have all the answers right then, if we want to just invite people to come up with their own answers, or if that defeats the story, like if you need a really good, clear um, path or method for your viewers or your listeners to have a good and strong story. I would say to you, I don't have the answer to your question, but here's my reflection. The model I'm giving you is around forcing choice. And so you ought to think about, are, is your issue ready to become a ballot question? So if we were in a war room in politics, I would say, that's not the right ballot question if we're going to win the campaign, right? So on the last campaign I worked on with Kathleen Wynne, we picked the wrong ballot question. We picked a ballot question around social justice and fairness when Ontarians are worried about taxes in their pocketbook. So they voted for Doug Ford. And we can, we can do a big reflection on that with Sam when he comes at the end of the course. You, climate change, I think, if I was giving ab, a, advice to climate change activists, the choice is too far away from the audience. So those of us that care about environmental justice are aware of what's happening and terrified, but it's not urgent enough. So when you think about the story of us, the story of me is about personalizing, making it human. The story of us is around the connectivity of the relationship. And then the story of now is about the choice. Climate change activists may want to consider, and it's about trade-offs, how do you make the choice more urgent at, about right now? Because, and, and I think some of the justice around um, veganism or plant-based diets is really interesting. A plant-based diet is an environmental, a form of environmental act, advocacy, but it's very immediate. I can choose to not consume meat three days a week and in doing so help save the, the, the ecosystem I live in. That's very different than telling me to drive a, you know, a electric vehicle or uh, live in a, a eco-friendly home. So I think there's some, there's some value in, in framing what's the question and what's the immediacy of the choice and is it ready for the ballot? Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Because a lot of people have criticized this climate clock as being too urgent and too, or almost like creating a question that makes people feel defeated because it's so scary. So there's a, such a fine line of the urgency, but also um, possibility and yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Julia. Um, Sierra, I think you're next. Thank you. Um, and thank you for your kind words earlier about the land acknowledgement. It's really appreciated. Um, so my question was with the example of Nike and we talked about how their first go around of trying to make the social commentary with Colin Kaepernick as the face of it didn't do so well and it kind of didn't deter them, but it showed them that that kind of action wouldn't necessarily be um, a positive thing in the market. But then the second time they went around this summer, it was really positive. And I think we can say the difference of that might have been timing, kind of the culture um, that around it. But are there other ways that you see brands can have the success of their second opportunity without necessarily the culture and the timing around it being so specific, I suppose? Yeah, I think, Sierra, what I would say is timing helps. Context is important. And we talked, we read that last week in some of the readings. What also is important, and I would challenge, this is where values collide with purpose, right? And Jamie will talk to you about this when we look at the fight for equal marriage in Canada. And I said equal marriage deliberately. Conservative LGBT Canadians and more progressive LGBT Canadians had to come together and say, we're going to stop calling it gay marriage and start calling it equal marriage because by calling equal marriage, we were able to create a movement, create a choice that was more inclusive and didn't create an us and them, right? So if you were to read um, a, a deconstruction of Hillary Clinton's campaign for president, one of the things that I think went wrong as someone who's worked in politics is she drew a line through America. And she said, you're either us or them. And you're either with me or you're not. You're part of the deplorables or you're part of the progressives that can be very unhelpful when you force choice, right? Story of me, story of us. If the us is too small, you lose. I think the Kaepernick story was easily manipulated by critics that it, it told white America that they were wrong. 
whether that was Nike's intention or not, the ad showed up as white America, you're terrible. You made Colin Kaepernick lose his career. If you look at the second Nike ad, it drew a big circle and said, it's on us to change this. It's just not right. It didn't say black America is struggling more. It didn't say white America is the oppressor. It said, what the heck is going on that people are losing their lives and being taped? And so it allowed, it enlisted people into that us story and then issued the call to leadership of don't just, don't turn away. It's time for us to take action. Great. Um, Sarah? Yeah, thank you. Um, I just had a question kind of building off of kind of what Sophia brought up a bit about the kind of the self in the story and just thinking of some other kind of more not quite as recent, but still relatively recent movements like the Me Too movement, for example. Um, and especially, I mean, using that example, the idea of like uh, sexual assault survivors, um, et cetera, coming forward and making that a part of their story. Do you, I mean, this is more of kind of a personal question to you. I'm not sure that there's a, a, an all encompassing answer, but do you think that what you include in your story has limits or that there are parts that you should always omit or that it's more of kind of a knowing your audience situation? I think that when you, when we read and think about this concept of self, it doesn't always demand that you provide biographical or autoethnographical details. It demands that you provide some level of a person, right? So it's about creating and again, you would have seen this in the prints, it's about creating a protagonist that the reader can identify with, right? It's about creating the hero that says, I can identify with that work. When, when I was doing crisis communications and helping people out of problems that they probably shouldn't have gotten themselves into, we would often say to the client, tell us everything now, everything possible now, because it allows us to correct, craft a story of you that gives the audience, everybody that's going to turn on 6 o'clock news, the trigger of there but by the grace of God go I. If we know everything, we will not create a hero archetype that will then be deconstructed by your critic, right? So for example, when someone says, I only cheated once on my spouse, and then you, do, you design a campaign that says they made one error, and then the next week it's like, oh, well, it was actually four times. Then you, you've lost all credibility. That story of self, that story of protagonist is completely obliterated and you lose. I would say, you know, if you think about Justin Trudeau and the blackface controversy, the fact that they didn't tell Canadians everything at the first thing made that story that much more painful for someone like myself to watch and be like, why did we pretend that it was once when it was actually a minimum of three times? Do you know what I mean? So in the self, it's not demanding painful disclosure. It's demanding the creation of a protagonist that's identifiable so that the us story then drives the right choice at ballot. Does that make sense? Great. Uh, are there other questions? Um, I, maybe I'll jump in with one. Um, David, I'm thinking about uh, the question of whether or not the only sort of tool in the, in the kit of the consumer is their dollars, whether they spend them or withdraw them. I'm thinking about this um, in, I'm, I'm on a, the board of an NGO and we've become very aware of the, our messaging around the amount of the donations that are actually going to the, the target um, group. And that's because there's, in part, there's a lawsuit in Quebec where um, NGO, a particular NGO is being taken to court over their messaging around this kind of thing, around the amount of money that is actually going to, you know, the, the person, the, the groups that are, are being supported. So I'm wondering, you know, are, are there other mechanisms that consumers have if the corporations are taking on what almost looks like political power, you know, are there other mechanisms that, that uh, consumers or citizens have in relation to corporations? It's a very interesting question. And I think this concept of stakeholder over shareholder in corporate governance is going to be really important. And I think that both consumers who become more aware of investor, um, measurement of a company's obligation to, to stakeholders will have more power and CEOs that appreciate the risk of not fulfilling stakeholder confidence broader than the shareholder will have more power. So by that, I mean, you know, 
in my experience, I've often worked on, on files where you're trying to win a proxy vote or you're trying to get through your AGM, for example, and particular activist shareholders who may be a union, for example, are very effective at leveraging the media to talk about issues that are completely unrelated to the financial performance of the company, but raise questions about ethics, governance, and values of the company, which makes investors and directors worried, right? Mm -hmm. So I think as, as this concept of stakeholder becomes more broadly accepted, and there's this whole new area of legal practice, and it'd be interesting to talk to uh, Dean Chamberlain and some others at the law faculty around e ESG in governments, so environmental social governance, not just did you fulfill your financial return obligation? It'll be really interesting. So I'm, you know, I think about we used to run companies from a great, let's build great organizations that will provide stable income and help create an economy. I think we've gone into a phase of we run companies quarter by quarter to meet performance and earnings. And I, I, I would hope we're moving to a place where we're we're getting to a place that's in the middle where we're running companies to do the right, to do well by doing good. And how do you measure that? And then what are the levers in place to, to, to hold people accountable? And I think the media is one of them. Thank you so much. I think we're getting close to the time where we may need to wrap up. Um, we had lots of people watching, but uh, I don't think we have any Q and A uh, action. Um, so probably I'm going to invite, oh, here's one. Um, so um, this is actually from one of our students. I'm also a storyteller, but sometimes I worry that my stories uh, deduce um, from empowering the group that I'm serving. Do you have a suggestion? Empowering the group that I'm serving. Um, I need some help with that one. Um, Um, does the writer maybe, um, folk, and she says, okay, focusing too much on me and not on them. So seemingly by telling her own story, is it actually detracting from representing the group more successfully? Yeah, I think that relates back a little bit to, the, I think it was Sarah and I having that conversation around how much biography do you put in the story? I think you know, again, if you think about a protagonist, you want to design a protagonist that's relatable to the audience you're trying to persuade. Um, and so, and again, that's where sometimes it becomes uncomfortable for the storyteller because you could be compromising in some respects. If I go to politics where I'm very comfortable, if you think about Barack Obama and the way that the his campaign in, in, in 2008 shaped a protagonist that was acceptable to America, they did that tremendously successfully, right? Critics said he wasn't black enough. Critics said he grew up in Hawaii. Critics said he went to white institutions. Mm -hmm. He still won the presidency. And I, Obama did an interview yesterday on Pod Save America. I'd encourage everybody to listen to it, where he revisits that case. He says, people will say that I didn't you know, eradicate poverty, that I didn't ensure racial justice, that I didn't you know, enshrine the Affordable Care Act into law. But I was the first black president of the United States. We have the Affordable Care Act and we did close the wealth gap to a black American. So he sort of says we had to build a protagonist that was electable. And I think if you then contrast that with Kamala Harris, you're seeing that again, right? Kamala Harris's trajectory is, is admirable, but it leaves room for criticism for purists on the left. And I think the Biden campaign has done something where they've said, we're going to move her from hard-nosed prosecutor that that you know had a had a tough go in California to black girl magic, which is what America wants right now. And I I was watching the news today, and I was look I was like, go Kamala, because they've they've crafted a protagonist that's getting America excited again. And so I'd say to you, as you tell stories, it's a difficult exercise, but think about how you craft that protagonist to move the audience and the reader. Great. Uh, Julia, I think you have another one. Just in crafting that story and thinking about the audience, do you find that you do change your story and alter it for every audience? It's a little bit different and you do omit details or you maybe use someone else as that protagonist you want people to relate to? I'll tell you right now, any story, anyone who does what I do and says that they don't modify their story is probably being dishonest. Um, so, you know, when I go to, when I go see my brothers who live in the Southern United States and are both ministers, do I ever lean in to my upbringing? 
Do I ever lean into call and response? Do I ever quote hymns and, and scripture that I know are going to get the room excited? I can, I can still do that, right? When I go talk at the 519 or Casey House, do I ever lean into the fact that I'm a gay identified cisgendered black man in Toronto, right? When I'm at the Board of Governors at the university, I lean into my experience teaching here and at U of T, being at three different universities, understanding higher education policy. So you have to acknowledge that there are certain parts of your origin story, which we talked about uh, in one of our earlier classes, that will resonate more with your audience. It doesn't mean that I'll deny a part of me. If I'm asked in the Southern US, are you gay? My answer is yes. If I'm asked in Church Street, do you are you a faithful person? Yes. Do I still believe in what I was taught? I do. I have to reconcile my faith in my life. That's That's my identity. So I don't deny it, but I definitely amplify different parts of that for sure. Great. Uh, any final questions or thoughts from the group? Um, I think I want to invite Buzra to say a few words. Yep. Um, thank you, Patrick. And um, obviously, thank you, David, both for this talk and for your classes. And obviously, thank, um, thank you for your time. Um, uh, this your talk here encapsulates what we have been talking and what we will continue to talk about in your classes. But um, if I were to so a lot of the keywords that come up uh, when we just when we think about and talk about your class and your talk is uh, how exciting it all is and how transformative. But um, when I say thank you, I also would like to focus on um, like how effective and powerful subtle moments can be and how you i think both your talk your today shows and your lectures has shown so far um the power that small moments and the power that a uh, subtle and effective communication uh could hold for us and uh more importantly i think uh as you say in our journey as learners I think one of the things that you have shown and you uh, will continue to show in the class is the confidence to be able to uh, capitalize, focus, and use those subtle moments effectively. So um, thank you both for your classes and for your talk today. And thank you for like reminding and keeping our focus three hours a week and now for an hour on the subtle moments that hold power on us. Thank you. And I will just say, brilliant, Buzra, as always. And I just want to end by thanking the whole uh, audience, those of you we can't see. Um, you really are Sasa, and you're you're part of us. And uh, certainly, David is is creating an amazing platform for our program to grow, for our students to grow. But you are also doing that by your presence here and your ongoing commitment to us. So I thank you all. And uh, please join us November 13th. We have Indigenous storyteller writer Tommy Pico giving a talk. And a week later, he'll be doing um, a writer's workshop. So stay tuned. Thanks very much, everyone. <laughs>